Hello and welcome to the Kryptonite Podcast. My name is Mark Storrs and hanging out with me as always, Christopher Carnicelli. Changed it up this week and you yeah. are. Oh, I'm just excited to be here and I get to say my name and that name is Uncle Bobby. I was going to do your name too. Were you? I was going to. Then why'd you point at me and ask me who I was? I was going to speak, but you kept talking. Oh. It's okay. I like yeah, it. I, I like it. You know. Hmm. It's got a little bit of aggression behind it. A little bit. Yeah, I like it. It's cool. It's yeah. good. It sets the tone for today's pod. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, so that's happening We're now. setting the aggressive tone. You got a stack of Coors Lights. I'd hardly call it a stack. I mean, you got a stack. We got three. It's a triptych. It's a, it's a, it's a whistle wetter. You know, I'm not getting like hard into the bourbon, just okay. a little summertime, yeah. little summertime nice. palate cleanser. A little summertime like diarrhea. Mm, yeah, well, dude. No, that doesn't usually give me the shit. Nah. That's because it's only three. We have like six or seven. Oh, yeah. That's a whole other breed of cat. I'm normally good with the Coors. The Paps is what gets me now. When I get to like nine or ten, like the next day, I'm like, yep, these shits are going to be indescribable. Oh, let's let's get into the cream ales then. <laughs> oh, let's yeah. Let's really talk about. You were about... at my house and no, I drinking the cream, cream ales. Hell yeah, yeah I was. Dude, some Jennies. Fuck yeah, dude. All right, boys, coming up. We have a movie night with the boys. The movie will be The Devil's Sword. Oh my gosh, I'm so stoked. This is going to be on our Discord, which is available if you are a patron on the $1 or the $5 tier. Patreon.com slash Kryptonite Podcast will get you access to the Discord. Grab your popcorn and join us in the Crypto Theater Friday, July 28th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a viewing of The Devil's Sword commentated... Mystery Science Theater 3000 style by the boys. So you're going to watch a movie and we're going to talk over it. So if you like want to like study this thing, this is not the time to watch it. Probably not. No. But I mean, that's a little bit of a misnomer. Like we're not there like constantly rattling off cracking jokes. We're, it's just sort of conversational good time watching a movie with your yeah. buddies. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a more accurate assessment. So we're not, we're not there to perform. We're there to have a good time. Watch a crazy ass Indonesian early 80s uh, fantasy exploitation, you know, sword and, and wizardry and martial arts epic mayhem. And, uh, and it's got alligator people. It's got flying heads. Oh, it's got man. just yes, all sorts of a, wonders. I got a feeling this one might get a little mystery science theater on us because I, 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 and I've seen parts of this movie i know how fucking bonkers it gets oh. i did a little bit of a, a little bit of a work early on this one to check it out and i was like oh shit this is the thing i like it i love this <laughs> movie is exciting. A thing. i love barry prima yeah. like the just one of the most hardcore action hardcore is a weird way of putting it but like he was <laughs> the man. go-to action star of the 80s okay. uh, for indonesia and it's really a fun wild movie so be there or be square whoa whoa dude aggressive be there and be square oh no don't be square no we're squares oh, oh nice. we're totally squares so there it is check it out movie night discord we'll be there hanging out come by have some drinks with us it will be fun this week oh robert episode 298 oh oh get down shit. it's creeping baby it's creeping right up your leg <laughs> it's going there we're talking hollywood horrors mysterious origins of the blob it crawls it creeps. It eats you alive. Indestructible. Indescribable. Insatiable. Bloated with the blood of its victims. Nothing can stop it. These are just a fistful of the gloriously hyperbolic taglines used to market one of the 50s most memorable creature features, the blob. But while nearly every movie fan is at least familiar with the amorphous, undulating mega mass from another world, very few are aware of the fact that the likely genesis for this sinister flesh-sucking fiend is an incident that took place in Philadelphia in the fall of 1950. So I'm pretty fucking sure I'm the one that first posited this theory. I came across an article about... Uh, what I called a purple glob in an old Frank Edwards book from, I don't know, like the fifties or the sixties. And it seemed like it naturally went together. I'm not going to like do too many spoilers right now. Cause obviously that's what our podcast today is about. But right now it's out there like in the ether that this is the de facto inspiration, like the real life, true horror that inspired the movie, the blob. And it was a theory I put out there. Uh, maybe Maybe I flirted with it on American Monsters, but definitely back in the, um, you know, like 2010 to 13 era when I was writing for uh, Mysterious Universe, I, I did a story for them called Beware the Glob. So I'm pretty sure that this theory comes back uh, to us here. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, let's re-explore the nuances of uh, 
the origins of the blob. All right, Rob, let's do it. The 1950s produced a plethora of bizarre beings stomping, slithering, and crawling their way across the silver screen. Some were from space, others hailed from the ocean's depths or the bowels of the earth. There's those fucking brain eating things. I can't remember which one. Like, I think it's literally called the brain eaters. They came, they were like little fuzzy slippers that came from the bowels of the earth. It's a really fun movie. <laughs> Many were made by madmen in garish labs full of boiling beakers and blinking lights, and almost all of them had somehow been affected by the 20th century's brand new boogeyman, the atom bomb. These beautiful black and white exercises in imagination ranged from the cheesy to the sublime and were B-movies in the most accurate sense of the word in that they were short often lurid, and almost always played on the bottom half of a double bill with a bigger, more lavish studio production. These rough-hewn celluloid gems are beloved by monster kids of all generations who delight, especially on the cheaper end of the cinematic compass, in their hammy acting, stilted dialogue, wholly inaccurate yet incredibly complex scientific jargon, and of course, first and foremost, the delightfully bizarre beasts that were paraded across local movie screens week after week to the endless thrill of throngs of dedicated, famous monster-obsessed fanboys, and more than a few less celebrated but just as fanatical fangirls. Many of the most memorable of these poverty row predators were created by the criminally underrated Paul Blaisdell. Big shout out to our buddy Lance Irwin. Sent me the book about Paul Blaisdell, Monster Hunter. Oh, yeah, what up? Not only good buddy, brilliant fucking illustrator, and there's going to be some shit in the future with that, but put a little fucking pin in that. Paul Blaisdell, who with his wife Jackie managed to make, alone in their Topanga Canyon garage with virtually no money, some of the most original and unforgettable creatures ever captured on celluloid. The startling array of monsters they made for movies like Roger Corman's It Conquered the World, The She-Creature, and Invasion of the Saucer Men, just to name a few, managed to capture the imagination of millions of kids worldwide since they were first unleashed on the unsuspecting world in the mid-50s. But this isn't about Hollywood monster makers, both celebrated and sadly all but forgotten. This is about those very rare true-life cases that, allegedly, inspired filmmakers to wrap fantastic stories around actual events. Events that, in the case we'll be dealing with today, resulted in one of the most famous fictional monsters ever concocted, and inarguably, one of the most popular creature features to emerge from the, at least cinematically, fabulous 50s. Because, you know, segregation, women's rights, lack thereof. It wasn't, you know, it was a social shit show, but fucking the monsters of the 50s? Yeah. Mwah. Chef kiss. But as I said, we're not here to talk about shamefully disregarded Hollywood artisans celebrated by those in the know, but who ought to be mainstream icons or Cold War era sociopolitical issues. We're here to talk about monsters, real deal old school monsters. So let's get to it. In 1958, producer Jack Harris, director Irvin Shorty Yeworth Jr., the whole shebang, and writer Irvin H. Milgate introduced the world to a soon-to-be iconic Steve McQueen, and more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, a squishy red flesh-eating alien known as the Blob. The film concerned itself with a bunch of small-town teenage hot rodders, all played, needless to say, by actors who looked like they were pushing 30, who in what has become a classic trope in movies like Fred Decker's minor mid-80s masterpiece Night of the Creeps or the or Stephen Chiodo's wildly entertaining late-80s romp Killer Clowns from Outer Space, witness a flaming meteor streak across the sky and decide to pursue it with some decidedly nasty results. In the case of the blob, it is found first by an elderly hermit who makes the unfortunate decision to poke the small, steaming, pockmarked hunk of space rock with a stick, cracking it open and unleashing the diabolical life form within. Not being a big fan of spoilers, let's just say things go downhill from there as the more humans this undulating entity devours, the bigger it gets. Simple math. Yeah. This gooey fiend first oozed its way across movie screens on on September 12th, 1958, scaring the pants off a generation of teens in theaters and drive-ins nationwide. 
With its one-of-a-kind creature, solid performances, rich colors, and a catchy theme song by a young Burt Baccarat, <laughs> which I'm sorry, I just had to laugh, which became a U.S. hit peaking at number 33 on the Billboard chart, this modest $110,000 film managed to gross over $4 million at the box office, quite a coup for a low-budget independent movie filmed in and around Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. But while this B-movie beast has become an icon in its own right, even spawning a highly entertaining 1988 remake by Chuck Russell of fucking Dream Warriors fame, the best Nightmare on Elm Street fucking sequel as far as I'm concerned, which is not really a stretch. And that is like an odyssey of 80s effects. I mean, I know we all agree that a thing, well, the thing from another world remake, The Thing, John Carpenter's, yeah, and obviously right. Cronenberg's The Fly are incredible remakes. But Chuck Russell's 88 Blob is fantastic. Oh, yeah. it's one of my favorites for sure. There are few who realize that the Blob's original creator, Irvin H. Milgate, was almost certainly, in my opinion, as both a lover and scholar of cult cinema and paranormal lore, inspired by a real-life run-in with a gelatinous and allegedly extraterrestrial life form that was encountered by four Philadelphia police officers in the autumn of 1950. I'll explain. In the September 27th, 1950 edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer, readers were treated to a truly bizarre headline which read, Flying Saucer Just Dissolves. The quirky story, which was quickly picked up by the National Wire Services, chronicled the tale of two veteran Philadelphia police officers, Joe Keenan and John Collins, who, while on patrol, spied a strange object falling through the night sky less than 24 hours before the story hit the papers, resulting in an encounter that they would not soon forget. According to the officers, they were in their patrol car making their evening rounds when they turned down a desolate side street between Vare Avenue and 26th Street. As they rounded the corner, the policemen were amazed by the sight of a large, glittering, unidentified mass that seemed to be drifting toward an open field just half a block distant. The bewildered the bewildered cops, excuse me, wasted no time in racing toward the unidentified falling object, which was now so low that it was inexplicably sparkling under the headlight's glare. Once their patrol car screeched to a halt, the officers snagged their flashlights and rushed toward the now earthbound, quivering, domed mound, which they said looked like purple jelly. Just a big old mound of purple jelly. Not the band, right? Nope. Oh, no, that was that green was, jelly. That was green jelly. Like, yeah, yeah, shit, green jelly. jelly. No, it was green jelly. You're right. Yeah, God. It was green jelly first, but then they got busted. Yes, yeah, that's right. right. But big yeah. jello. And then the, <laughs> big jello. But the, the, cover, big the, the cover band would be purple jelly. There it is. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, totally. it, could be, it could be like a prince <laughs> oh. slash oh, yeah, there you go. green jelly cover band called oh, purple jelly. That, that would be weird. That actually would be really fucking cool. When doves cry and then we used to print right. songs and green jelly songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh boy, it's been a long day. All right, Robert, continuing on. The perplexed policemen could only stare down in stunned silence at the eerily pulsating heap that glistened beneath their flashlights. The officers estimated that the round mass was approximately six feet in diameter and nearly a foot. A foot. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, fucking read there, yeah, buddy. It's about a fuck thick. Yeah. The fuck, Rob? Oh, my a God. You, you can start combining words. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I like it. Jeez Louise. It's a new form of measurement. Fucking foot thick at oh the center. God. The edges slope down from the peak top of the glob, as Frank Edwards dubbed it in his tome, Strange World, in a chapter titled The Police in the Purple Glob, tapering to a lip that was just a couple of inches thick. When they turned off their flashlights, the men discovered, to their surprise, that the hulking mass emitted a faint purplish glow. Was this a form of bioluminescence, or had the glob somehow managed to absorb the energy from the flashlights, emitting it back at the officers? Sadly, there's no way to know. The most disturbing thing about this odd object, according to officers Keenan and Collins, was the fact that this iridescent jelly-like substance seemed to vibrate as if intentionally palpitating its body. There's even one report that claimed this entity wasn't just trembling, but actually moving of its own accord, oozing, quote-unquote, up a nearby telephone pole. 
and that adds a whole other dimension. Yeah, no. When it's, right. Yeah, when it's going skyward. Yeah, that's the fine line yeah. between this is some shit that like fell out of uh, you know a fuselage of a plane or something or who the hell knows what to is this motherfucker alive? Yeah, booking up a pole. And is it a foot thick? It's because it, it might be. Seemingly, is it listening to green jelly? That's what we need to know. Regardless, oh no, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Is this indicative of animal of an animal like instinct to escape or an intelligent effort to gain higher ground and survey the situation? That's a question mark. <laughs> Regardless of the limits of its intelligence or mobility. The fact that the thing moved at all seemed to indicate to the officers on the scene that this blob-like entity was almost certainly a living organism. At this point, the two cops, fearing no one would believe their story, sagely radioed for backup, and within minutes, patrolmen James Cooper and Sergeant Joe Cook arrived at the scene of this extraordinary close encounter. After a perfunctory investigation, Cook speculated that the object appeared to be solid enough to actually lift, so he entreated his cohorts to help him have a go at it. The four officers evenly, and hesitantly one must assume, spaced themselves around the glob. Collins was the first to screw up the courage to actually touch the substance and found, to his surprise, that this seemingly solid object instantly broke apart in his hands. Tiny pieces of the glob remained attached to his palms and fingers, but within seconds they evaporated, leaving nothing but a residue of quote-unquote odorless scum on his skin. Oh, yeah. It's good that it's odorless. I mean, that's a plus. You know, I mean, like sour milk or some nasty assery. Yeah. But huh. scum is never pleasant. No, no. No. Uh, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, I uh, deal with scum on the daily, and it stinks. So, yeah, okay. Well, this for them is good, but probably not. Yep. yep. That's the other kind of scum. Okay, bad times. This evidently started a chain reaction, and the officers could only watch with what must have been a combination of horror and astonishment as the purple goo slowly but surely evaporated before their eyes. Less than half an hour after the arrival of officers Cooper and Cook, the object had completely vanished, leaving nothing in its wake but four mystified Philadelphia patrolmen. It's not known if, during the process of evaporation, any of the constables considered or attempted to preserve a piece of this potentially earth-shattering entity for scientific study. But considering the fact that these were a bunch of tough Philly street cops in 1950 with bigger and more dangerous fish to fry than space globs, it would not at all be surprising if the thought never even crossed their minds. It's hard to know what thoughts raced through their heads, however, as these four men watched the bizarre specimen disappear, but they dutifully filled out a report regarding the unusual incident and filed it. By the following morning, whether it was through the rumor mill or diligent legwork, the press was all over the stories of the officers and what was referred to in the papers as a flying saucer. Later that same day, officers Keenan, Collins, Cooper, and Cook were paraded out in front of a group of newsmen eager to get the details of their sci-fi run-in. To their eternal credit, the four lawmen stuck to their story, evidently making it abundantly clear that they believed that the glob, whatever it was and from wherever it had come, was indeed a living creature. Oh, they're going right towards, like, this is some biological shit. I mean, it's crawling up a pole. Uh, well, Evidently, yeah, yeah. according to one account at least. So this is the story. This is the event. It only got very limited. Well, it got big press, actually. It got picked up by the wire service, like I said, but it, there wasn't a ton of information because this is the entirety of what happened. Yeah. So now I'm going to bring it back to the cinematica aspect of things. Some seven years after this event, the head of visual aids for the Boy Scouts of America, that's right, visual aids, I don't know if that's posters, I don't know if it's signage, yeah, I don't know a, what's going like on. A graphic designer? I, okay, sure. Cool. All right. Awesome. Dope job if you can get it. The aforementioned Irvin H. Milgate was tasked by his friend, movie producer Jack H. Harris, to come up with a marketable concept he could turn into a feature film. In the late 1950s, science fiction was all the rage, and coming up with a unique creature to impress fans and distributors of this 
already oversaturated genre was no easy task, but Millgate was eager to tackle the problem posed by Harris. In Harris's own words, quote, it's got to be a monster movie. It's got to be in color instead of black and white. It can't be a cheapy creepy. It's got to have some substance to it. It's got to have characters you can believe in. And there's got to be a unique monster. Never been done before. And the method of killing the monster would have to be something that grandma could have cooked up on her stove. End quote. Those were the rules set out. And fucking Millgate was like, all right, let's see what we can do. Nice. Bearing these restrictions in mind, Millgate would stew on this. And I feel quite likely... Recall the strange tale of the four confused cops and the purple glob that descended from the heavens, which had been in newspapers across the globe. Of course, for dramatic purposes, Millgate would take the virtually inert, possibly alien substance that had landed in Philadelphia and transform it into a monster hell-bent on devouring all life on Earth, or at least the citizens of the small Pennsylvania town in which the movie was set. That's another thing. Mm. It was filmed and set in Pennsylvania. This event obviously happened in Philly. So, right. Excited by his late night brainstorm, Millgate phoned Harris from California at 11.30 p.m., making it 2.30 a.m. in New York City, where the producer was sound asleep at the St. Regis Hotel. In his wonderful 2015 autobiography, Father of the Blob, The Making of a Smash and Other Hollywood Tales, Harris recalled his buddy's excited, sleep-stealing voice writing, quote, I sleepily picked up the receiver and said yes. From out of the earpiece, from out, excuse me, out of the earpiece burst the exclamation, Jack, we've got it. We have the answer. It was Irvine calling me from California. He went on. We have a monster never done before. It's a mineral form of life from another world. It defies gravity by climbing trees and has the ability to zap prey. It can fall from any height onto the ground and reform itself on the bottom. End quote. With the exception of the mineral aspect, Milgate's mercurial monster seems uncannily similar to our shivering, oozing, potentially pole-climbing friend from Philadelphia. What I found particularly striking were Milgate's ideas regarding this creature's abilities to defy, quote, gravity by climbing trees, end quote, as well as, quote, fall from any height onto the ground and reform itself at the bottom. And what was the original title to be? You guessed it. The Molten Meteor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Nailed it. Yeah. Boom. Guess what, boys? Back to the drawing board with you because that's dog shit. Oh, but, boy. I mean, you But know. it's not atypical of, like, allied artist pictures of the era. Right. Like, 50s movies, I mean, you, you know, you got to give... I mean, I know this is not what we're doing. I'm not going to, like, make this a lecture on 50s sci-fi, but, like... <laughs> You know, you know, Samuel Z. Arkoff and James Nicholson at AIP, they basically started the teenage market and they would just come out with anything. You yeah. know, they had the super catchy ones like I was a teenage werewolf and the beast with a million eyes. Mm. That movie blew. I was a teenage werewolf was OK, but they would just like hammer out all this shit. And some of the lesser studios, like again, like Allied Artist or uh, um, Robert Lipper, these people would just just have dog shit titles yeah. like garb. So this could have been released under this name right. thankfully wasn't whatever the specifics may or may not be regarding Irvine Millgates. I think it's Irvine. Yes. Initial inspiration. According to Mark Thomas McGee in his 2018 book, you won't believe your eyes, a front row look at the science fiction and horror films of the fifties revised and expanded monster kids edition. That's a fucking mouthful. That's a lot for the library to process right it's, there. It's a good book though. It's <laughs> a terrible title. According to Mark Thomas McGee, let's keep it at that. Theodore Simonson, whose only other credit appears to be on another Jack Harris sci-fi romp, 1959's enjoyably offbeat 4D man, he can go through walls, took Millgate's idea of authorities running afoul of an amorphous amoboidal, amoboidal. That's a word? A, amoeboidal. <laughs> amoeboidal? <It's>, yeah. <laughs> amoeboidal. Amoeboidal. There, I've got it, finally. You, it's like being like an amoeba. It's an amoeboidal. Just wrote it's yourself amoeba-like. In, you just wrote yourself into a corner, and, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Savor this deliciousness. Okay. Authorities running afoul of an amorphous amoeboidal, <laughs> said it all wrong, alien abomination. Amoeboidal. Amoeboidal. Ah, <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. And shaped it into a story where upon screenwriter Kay Lineker, 
using her married name, Kate Phillips, dropped the unwieldy molten meteor moniker in favor of the much catchier Blob. But first she called it Glob, then she tweaked it. Nice. Fashioning it into one of the best known and most ferociously lampooned monster movies in the history of cinema. And that's fair. Although the bizarre 1950 Philadelphia incident almost certainly helped inspire the creation of one of the world's favorite invertebrate 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 god reading a lot aberrations making it a fascinating footnote in movie history and a benchmark for fantasy film lovers the world over the mystery of what was this thing whether living or inert that simply that simply seemed to float out of the sky endures to this day in fact we are no closer to solving this conundrum now than we were nearly three quarters of a century ago but as any 14 enthusiast could tell you, this event was not the first, nor would it be the last time, that so-called purple globs would rain from the sky. Intriguingly, on August 11, 1979, a woman named Sybil Christian was standing on the front lawn of her home in Frisco, Texas, watching the Perseid meteor shower. Did I say that right, Chris? I know you love your astronomy. Um, Perseid? Perseids? Perseid. Perseid? Yeah, that, the so. famous meteor shower. Yeah, you're right. Following the celestial fireworks display, Christian noticed three purple, seemingly metal filled blobs on her lawn, which she claimed radiated heat. Which, with the exception of radiating heat, sure sounds an awful lot like Philly's purple metal flecked glob. Christian, displaying the kind of foresight rarely seen in such situations, assumed that they might be of scientific value and immediately contacted local authorities and asked them to recover the samples from her lawn. Before the police could arrive, one of the globs had already evaporated, but two remained. These samples were collected and one was preserved for analysis by NASA. Upon inspection, in a move that had jaws dropping to the floor, NASA scientists conceded that the strange substance was organic and might well represent an alien life form. I haven't read the paperwork. It's okay. just I've read the articles. Really, NASA? But okay. in a very Bet's Mystery Sphere sort of fashion. Oh, well, hi, Nick. The very next day, in a move that would raise more than a few eyebrows, they recanted, claiming that it was nothing more than industrial waste. While this is certainly possible, the Fox Mulder in me remains skeptical that such definitive analysis and theoretical turnaround, either for or against it being an organism, would would, would have been possible in such a short time frame. Like, I'm shocked they jumped right to it. I'm not as shocked that they, you know, you know, took it back, but right. ah, it's just weird. It doesn't no, know. Some excited people said something they probably shouldn't have said. Stepped out of bounds. That's, yeah. I mean, someone got all excited, like "Oh, dee, 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 dee. and that's all they said. That's yeah. That was exactly it. They did some weird shuffle, and the next thing you know, they're like, "Listen, Ted's not right. All right, he's got shit going on. His light, his wife left him. He's gonna lose his job. <laughs> all right, he's all right. He's fine. But this this shit ain't from like, space. All right. No, and it is a lot easier to like step back and be like, "Oh, well, hold on. Kind of like not... uh, kind of like Roswell. Oh, hey, look, 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 you got a UFO here, boys. Oh shit, sorry, no, we don't. Exactly so, like yeah, that. There yeah. You go. Fucking Heineck in the background, dude. Puppet master, evil dark Heineck making it happen. Playing the keys. Oh, wow. Yeah, dude. He's shredding. Years later, NASA geochemist Doug Blanchard confirmed the reality of the case, stating, The blobs were found by Mrs. Sybil Christian on the front lawn of her home in Frisco, a farming town near Dallas. She described them as looking like smooth, whipped cream, only purple. The blobs, which were about the size of a telephone and weighed a couple of pounds apiece, I'm assuming like a big old bulky rotary dial phone, right. no. were warm to the touch and contained small chunks of lead. One melted away on the lawn, but the police took the remaining two to the Heard National Space Museum nearby, and eventually one ended up at NASA. So what's interesting is that at least this guy, who's a legitimate dude, you know, I've, I've vetted him as much as, you know, Google lets you, um, 
that was found there and NASA did get a hold of one. So it's not just a bunch of you know, like weekly world news bullshit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't mean that there's anything spectacular about the find. Okay. But it's interesting that it did happen. Could be something from a septic tank and NASA has a hold of it now. Oh, well, you'll find out what people think it is. Okay. While NASA's test results are not readily available, the assistant director of the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, Ron DeLulio, took it upon himself to debunk the extraterrestrial theory. Eventually, he stumbled across a battery reprocessing plant about two miles away from Christian's home, where he discovered that a caustic soda, which was used to clean impurities from the lead salvaged from the old batteries, resembled a reddish blob-like substance. DeLulio, a name I just love saying, for the record, Mm. immediately declared the case closed. But that assertion seemed to have been a bit premature. When Christian was shown the industrial blobs, she concluded that they were not the same things that she had found on her property during the meteor shower. Furthermore, the blobs at the battery reprocessing plant were red and rigid as opposed to soft, purple, pliable globs like the ones found on Christian's lawn. Hmm. Finally, the test that should have proven that the purple globs were caustic soda came back inconclusive. Oh, shit. So it's it's another example of the skeptic comes in. It's a, it's a fine theory. Throw it out there. There's, there's no reasons for it, but, but everyone like just jumps on like, Oh yeah, clearly bullshit. When that's just as dubious as, well, maybe not just as dubious as, I don't know, fucking star beast, but you know, but it's, there's no basis. In fact, I like how you go to star beasts. Yeah. Oh, I'll be all over star beasts. Okay. I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Perhaps the most intriguing encounter with sky blobs occurred on September 28, 1969. On that day, scientists collected more than 200 pounds of a bizarre jelly-like material following a meteor shower over Murchison, Australia. These scientists and later NASA found amino acids, the chemical building blocks of DNA within the substance. Prometheus much? Could this potentially be confirmation of the panspermia hypothesis? The idea that the essential ingredients of life exist throughout the universe, traveling through space from one location to another, seeding worlds in the process. Or might it, or might it have been that terrestrial organic material coincidentally turned up at the same time as the meteor shower? So, Skycom? Skycom. Okay. Yep. Okay. Cool. Ish. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, the building blocks of life, right? Okay. Yep. Coming from this, coming from the sky. Star jizz. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, you had star beast and I got star jizz. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Man, that'd be a weird thing to clean up. You're like, Chris, we got a fucking 200 pounds of cum over here in the yard. Someone's not going to be happy. I mean, to I'm play. not doing it. I mean, I like how you asked Chris for <laughs> yeah. it because you know I'm not involved. <laughs> I was going to say Chris is closer, but he's not. You are. So I'm like, Rob. I mean, I'll take some samples. I'm calling Kevin for this shit. Okay. I'm calling my work wife. Him and I can take care of it. We deal with shit all the time. Angel hair and space jizz, man. It's all all falling from UFOs. Yeah, I got to call the maintenance crew from the sewage treatment plant to go clean that shit up. But I mean, if it is, you know... If it contains the building blocks of life, that's interesting. It is kind of... Now, that doesn't mean it's from outer space. If it is from outer space, that's fascinating. But even if it's not, there's still this huge mystery of where the fuck did this come from? Yeah, what is it representative of? And it's 200 fuck-sucking pounds. That's a lot. For that is blob. a lot of fucking organic material. That's a mass That's right like a there, whale dude. exploding in the sky, like a cyclone just... <laughs> that's almost as worse. <laughs> rips apart something huge. A fucking whale explodes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You know where it's a big place. Like, shit explodes a million light years away, and it just takes a while to get here. That's true too, but yeah, I mean, you know what I mean. Just like, and it's a one-off shot, right? Like, I'm I'm absolutely willing to buy it, but 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 that would imply that you know amino acids and the potential for living things. And I happen to already believe it. Most intelligent people believe that no, the, for sure. But to have it actually manifest would be the mind blower. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. Of course, these examples of space globs are just two of many reported events that have occurred over the past century and well before. On January 21st, 1803, a shooting star was seen hurtling toward Earth in the central European region of Silesia, which is primarily located in Poland. 
The meteor's trajectory was low, and witnesses, in a delightfully B-movie moment, claimed to have heard a whizzing sound as it sizzled through the atmosphere above them. The local citizenry formed a posse and followed the trail of flames until they found the burning meteorite. Eventually, the flames and the furor over the blazing object died down, and the posse went home. But when the good folks of Celestia returned the next morning, the meteorite was gone and had apparently been replaced with a mass of mucilaginous material. So another big honking mass of fucking snot, basically. I hope they beat it and set it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I hope they just bear, burn this thing and beat it. Yeah, well, because it could have some you know, treacherous shit in there. Mostly because you call it mucilaginous. That's true. It needs to die. Yep. Weirder still, on the evening of November 11th, 1846, observers claimed that an incandescent object crashed to Earth at Lowville, New York. Eyewitnesses rushed to the scene and discovered what they described as a, quote, heap of foul-smelling luminous jelly, end quote. And that's when it starts stinking. Which was estimated to be about four feet in diameter. Not unlike the globsters of the skies, if you will. Not surprisingly, this jelly evaporated within minutes. In more modern times, December of 1983 to be exact, a grayish, oily gelatin fell on North Reading, Massachusetts. Thomas Grinley reportedly found it on his lawn, the streets, and sidewalks. And on November 28, 2001, there was an alleged incident that occurred in Manchester, England, wherein researchers were called in to investigate reports of lights falling from the sky. What investigators found at the scene, however, were not meteors or friction-illuminated debris from a shattered satellite, but mound upon mound of, you guessed it, gooey globs. The shit is raining. Uh, Everywhere. Literally. Like, I mean, I get you call the authorities, but do the firemen get involved? You got to call the street department? Like, what do you do? You call science? You call the science know, patrol? Man. You want to get these boogers who, off who your yard? Who are Ultraman's friends? Well, yeah, of course, yeah. the science patrol. Science patrol. Yeah, but. Yeah. Okay. They, I don't know. They seem like they wouldn't get there very fast. And Dana, thank you for the ultra figures. We'll do more on that at the end of the pod. Yeah. Even more disturbing was the unearthly, thick, unnervingly syrupy rain that battered the tiny town of Oakville, Washington in August of 1994. This event, like the 1979 Frisco incident, occurred during the annual Perseid meteor shower. Just going to go with that. To their chagrin, scientists, scientists excuse me, revealed that this enigmatic goo contained Entrobacter, Coloque, and Pseudomonas fluorescens, said them all wrong, bacteria which are capable of causing severe illness. Oh, no. So now it's dude. not a party anymore. It's like botulism from God. <laughs> nice, dude. That's the kind of shit, though, that, like, you know, in, in the Moses days, that would have been a fucking yeah. curse from above. Yeah, dude. That's the, That will kill your yeah. whole tribe, your whole family, your Insects whole Insects are radioactive globs. <laughs> yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Malaria or whatever this thing's going to give you. Just a bad thing. And you don't want it falling from the sky. No, no. And I it's mean, not the first time I've read about, like, really corrupt. Like, I mean, I've actually read about rotten things falling from the sky, like like decaying animal parts and mm -hmm. weird shit. We've all heard, like, frogs oh, yeah, and, yeah. and fish yeah. and whatnot. And when they start rotting, that becomes trouble. But actually, like, bacteria-filled fucking syrup rain, scummy, thick, nasty ba bacteria rain. Okay. Oh, it's like an STD from heaven. Oh, All right. biologist Tim Davis also analyzed the Oakville substance and found what he believed to be a complex cell with a nucleus known as a eukaryotic, Jesus Christ, I have to break down these words, eukaryotic cell in the material. So that's something fucking else altogether. Could this herald the potential for a horrific extraterrestrial plague like the one depicted in Michael Crichton's 1969 sci-fi classic in the 1971 movie that followed, The Andromeda Strain. Mm. I think that was his first novel. Okay. Let's keep our fingers crossed, our heads down, and sadly our mouths closed during the next rainstorm. I love raindrops on my old tongue and dropping on my face. I can't have it after this. Uh, really? Oh, you don't. You never let raindrops hit your tongue. No, nope, sure don't. What the fuck is wrong with you, Chris? Did acid I, rain I scare mean, you? Not since I was a kid. 
I don't. I mean, do I'll it. go outside like chasing each one, going. Oh, oh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, no, nobody <laughs> said you did that. Nope. But. Someone's getting real defensive over here. Yeah. All right. So, Skyolingus is my jam. I'm not ashamed. I, I fucking. It was because your finger. You did this. Yeah, with you your, did I'm this like, thing with your fingers. No, I was chasing. You... That, no, it was not finger banging. That's either. how you run. If you run, run, this is how you run with oh, your weird fingers. You can't see what we're doing, but it's really <laughs> fucking weird. Oh, oh, well, I'm going down on the sky, <laughs> guys. Right. Okay, well, it's going up on the sky. Yeah, you're. Oh, <laughs> wow, going <laughs> up. You're right. So, uh, in all fairness, what goes on with me and Mother Nature is our biz. Okay, but cool. Secondly, oh, I love the feel of rain on my face. All right, awesome. That's that's cool. I'm glad. But not, you know, I mean, acid rain scared the fuck out of me. I'm not going to digress too eh, much. That's okay. But I was no, pretty yeah. convinced that that was going to be an issue. Eh, it's a quicksand. And after watching Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, I was sure that eventually, like in a, a Blade Runner type way, that hazy, misty L.A. future rain would right. get, yeah, like, gonna get eat yeah. through fucking yeah. your clothes and your flesh. That didn't end up being a problem, but apparently bacteria syrup rain is. Okay. Well, I mean, you take what you can get. Some of these examples are very much like Philly's purple glob, while others are only superficially similar. But what are we talking about? After centuries of reports, it might surprise some to know that science is only starting to get a grasp on these rare phenomenons. So let's get into some of the legitimate and more outlandish hypotheses regarding the origins of space globs. The first theory we'll be dealing with is that these blobs might be an example of a gelatinous substance known for ages, but which many modern academics are convinced never really existed. A material known as star jelly. Also known as astral jelly. It all seemed like shit you get a sex shop. <laughs> Astromixin and, and I'm definitely going to mess this one up. Pooter seer. What the fuck? Which is a, which is Welsh for, excuse me, a Welsh word for Rot from the stars. Oh, that's way cooler, dude. That's like a Dark Throne record. Fucking rot from the stars. Yeah. That's and only awesome. One fucking vowel in that whole mess. Yeah, I. I makes, yeah, it makes powder pewter seer pewter seer pewter seer. You're missing some some letters there, dog. Star jelly was, according to legend, a gummy substance that was believed to be brought to Earth via meteorites. Some supporters of the panspermia theory have speculated that all life on Earth emanated from a combination of the primordial soup that once coated the planet and the genetic seeds carried within star jelly. Reports of this viscous goop go back for at least 700 years. In the 14th century, priest and physician John of Gaddiston, Gaddiston, John of Gaddiston, not John Gaddiston, no, of, which is yeah. the best. Mentions Stella Ture, Latin for Earth Star, in his medical writings. He described the material as, quote, a certain, oh, here's my word again, mucilaginous, mucilaginous substance lying upon the earth, and even went so far as to suggest that it might be used to treat abscesses. Don't put that shit in your holes. Oh, boy. Not your body holes. No. Not your open infected body holes. Do not do that. No. Not your teeth with cavities. Oh. No abscesses. Don't pack it. No. No. Oh, Sorry. God. Geddenson. Another 14th century Latin medical glossary has an entry for oligo. This material was described as, quote, a certain fatty substance emitted from the earth that is commonly called a star which has fallen. So it's called a star which has fallen. And a lot of time shows up after a meteor shower. Okay. But it clearly comes from the bottom up. Yeah, what the fuck's up with that? I don't know. Sneaky? I mean... Sneaky goo? I've never heard of earth goo. Yeah. Yeah, neither have I. I mean, I've dug and found water. If I... Never if, goo. If, if I was digging down deep enough and I just found like this, you know, quivering mass of whitish or off-colored... I mean, I would assume maybe it was, I don't know, embryos or something, but I would definitely be skeeved out. Embryos? I don't know. Just cover it back up. There should be no white goo. <laughs> like, I mean, if you hit like a chemical I mean, line, unless it's maybe, the stuff, but... uh, can't get enough <sighs> yeah. of Larry Cohen's I mean, if, The if, Stuff. If it's a weird clay deposit, that's be strange. But a certain fatty substance? Yeah. Oh, it's gross. Um, yeah. An English Latin dictionary. Dictionary. There you go. You got a dictionary from 1440 has an entry for stir slim. Everyone try that word. What, what, stir yeah. slim. Stir, stir slim. Which is a medieval Latin term for shooting star. I would have thought star slime based on what I. Yeah. Read. Star no, stir sure. slim. Yeah. Star slime sounds way fucking cooler. While the debate rages on, most scientists doubt that star jelly even exists. 
One of the more popular and bizarre theories floating in the ether is that star jelly is nothing more than dead frogs. In 1824, volume 64 of the Philosophical Magazine, <laughs> excuse me, complied by Alexander Tillich and Richard Taylor, published an article titled The Natural History of the Toad. In it, Tillich and Taylor ascribed the genesis of star jelly to the decomposing carcasses of frogs, which they referred to as reptiles, a habit which lends little credibility to, to their academic credentials. Quote, the substance known by the name of star jelly or star shot, Tremella Nostoc, that's in parentheses, found on marshy ground is the decomposed bodies of toads or frogs, but more particularly the latter. The writer, this, the writer, excuse me, having frequently found the exuve of the reptile connected with it. And he has also seen the lacerated body of a frog lying on the margin of a lake one day and the next seen it converted into this substance, the atmosphere at the time being very humid and the weather wet, which appear to be necessary adjuncts to the formation of star jelly. It may be objected that this substance is sometimes found in places inaccessible to frogs and toads as the tops of thatched barns, hay ricks, etc., this is easily accounted for. These reptiles are the food of various birds of prey and by them carry to those situations to be devoured at their leisure. And if scared in the act, the lacerated frog or toad is left behind and in the state of weather and air is favorable to this mode of decomposition, star jelly is formed. If the weather is hot and dry, they are converted into a hard leathery substance. Frogs in particular are rarely decomposed by the usual processes of animal putrefaction. Do I need to get into this? fucking again um no i completely no but I, I mean it cannot possibly uh be every single situation can't be toads really though <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean unless the meteorite that one meteorite that fell like killed a exploded shit exploded yeah. and it, it, it just <laughs> fell on it happened to fall on toads a, like a colony gone. it's absurd do, do toads we, live in a colony we know it's absurd okay a murder of toads we're talking 1400s okay. or well now we're into the 1820s i have seen uh decomposing uh yeah i know things uh, yeah that's what i'm saying like but it's maybe, not maybe a few yeah. of them but it can't it can't be like no it's all it's all frogs it's all frogs it, can, it is one. not <laughs> no 100 no, it is okay. not all right well and it may be from the earth, and it may be from the sky, and it may be all these things. But, and I, I understand, like, perhaps as much as any um, episode we've ever done, this is all over the place. We're talking about, like, 1950s monster movies. No, I know. But this is basically our Star Jelly episode, okay. slash our beloved homage to uh, 50s sci-fi. Cool. I like it. And we're just, we're covering it all. But I agree. Toad's too much. Yeah, to yeah. Toad's a bridge too far for me. In 1848, author and naturalist, Samuel Griswold Goodrich, in his book, Tales About the Sun, Moon, and Stars, described star jelly as, quote, a gelatinous substance is occasionally found on the grass and even sometimes on the branches of trees, the origin of which the modern, the modern learned do not ascribe to either stars or to meteors. The animalists, though differing from each other in subordinate respects, agree in affirming it to be the altered remains of dead frogs. So again, the quantity of jelly, says one of these, produced from one single frog is almost beyond belief, even to five or six times its bulk when in its natural state. That is when the frog is in its living state, end quote. So this makes me hmm. think that this is just the tradition. Like, I don't know if, if there's like batteries of fucking old timey scientists standing around just staring at frogs decomposing and waiting for it to foam up. But. Okay. All right. Though the dead frog theory seems to have fallen out of favor, <laughs> there, there's also the ever popular speculation that space globs and star jelly might be nothing more than good old fashioned seagull puke. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this rather unappealing supposition was put forth by esteemed Welsh geologist and Woodwardian professor of geology at Cambridge University, Thomas McKenney Hughes who seems to have wryly written about Pudicure and nature back in 1910, stating, quote, On the other hand, he says that he saw a wounded gull disgorge a heap of half-digested earthworms much resembling star jelly, and that Sir William Craven saw a bittern do the same in a similar circumstance, end quote. 
Author Mark Pilkington, in his 2005 article for The Guardian titled The Blobs, further elaborated on this repugnant theme with a healthy dose of skepticism, writing, quote, Since at least the early 18th century, the most common earthbound explanation for the mystery goo has been that it has that it is, excuse me, something vomited up by birds or animals. The Welsh naturalist Thomas Pennant, writing later that century, considered this the answer. Currently popular is the idea that the gray gloop is frog spawn barfed up by amphibian eating creatures, though no frog's eggs have ever actually been identified within it, and most finds are a good deal larger than your average frog. A recent refinement of the concept is that if a frog is swallowed prior to ovulation, it's regurgitated egg ducts, which swell automatically when wet. (sighs) Okay, I'm kind of into seagull puke. I know that's a weird one to say, but it's kind of funny thinking about like seagulls flying. Well, I mean, puke on everybody. Birds puke. puke. Yeah, birds puke all the time, dude. Fuck. All and, right. and it still comes back to frogs, but so frog guts, bird puke. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> it's, it's the it's like the worst combination. I know. Ever. From these dubious and frankly disagreeable hypotheses into territory that's much more in our collective wheelhouse: monsters. Although strictly speaking, there is no evidence to support this theory, or the existence of the critters in question. That's a little hint. Call them critters. Whatsoever, my favorite explanation of the origin of space globs is that they are the remains of dead or dying atmospheric monsters. These speculative sky beasts are bizarre, allegedly airborne animals that can resemble anything from carnivorous pink clouds to puffy white sky spitters to soaring manta rays to floating jellyfish to multi wing one eyed super rods and calamitous air clams to Trevor, Trevor, excuse me, James Constable's human devouring air amoebas, which he dubbed critters. The, the, that was like the sky critters, right? Yeah. That we did. That was that whole weird, like there was that whole weird Jesus theory that went along with it that he ended up developing. And he claimed that many of the people that go missing that are never found yes. are the victims of these flying, you know, sky amoeba that yeah, shoot down, dude. eat them, and la la la. Yeah, because you don't know because they come and get you. And just for shits and giggles, that's episode six, Sky Spitter. Episode 12, Gargantuan Gliders. Episode 67, Crawfordsville Monster. Yeah, that's the Super Rod. Oh, that's right. The one-eyed that one. Super Rod. Yeah. You got episode 68, Hampton Bay Sky Rays. 119, the Carnivorous Pink Cloud. So if you're interested in sky shit, we got it. We got it <laughs> yeah. galore. But that is what my dream is. But I'll continue here because we're okay. getting close to the end. Debates rage on as to whether or not these beasts hail from near-Earth orbit or the depths of space, only very rarely coming down for a closer look or perhaps to feed. And even more contention exists between those who believe that the creatures may be sentient and those who insist they are nothing more than animals that live their skybound lives reliant on mere instinct. Paranormal author Ivan T. Sanderson speculated that numerous UFO accounts might actually represent, quote, extremely low-density animals native to the clouds, end quote. And celebrated cosmologist Carl Sagan theorized that lighter-than-air astrobiological beasts might be soaring through the skies of massive gas giants such as Jupiter. It's just possible that the gelatinous star jelly so often found following meteor showers may well be the decaying remains of these ostensibly invertebrate lighter-than-air animals. Perhaps falling stars strike these creatures in mid-flight, tearing them apart with the force of their impact and sending them hurtling earthward in as yet unidentifiable hunks of sometimes off-white, other times purplish, iridescent gut jam that usually evaporate within minutes of their unceremonious arrival. It should also be noted that there's a preponderance of individuals of both a skeptical and pro-paranormal bent who are reluctant to believe that these things exist at all. And that has to be said. A lot of people do not think that there are any advanced creatures anyway. Like, certainly, um, 
you know, single cell things living in the atmosphere and, right. and, and alien life forms to be sure. In fact, yeah. there's this one dude, this British dude with a glasses and a gray beard that's all the time sending up these little boxes and it's coming down and uh, Josh Gates was with him one time and some other TV show host and they're like, oh, nope, there it is, another alien. And they look weird and cool and small, but I mean, I just don't know what really? the, I don't know if the, the evidence is they, they catch him out. in the box? Yeah, it goes way, way up. Okay. Like super high. Right. I don't know, stratosphere. I don't I don't know exactly the words. Okay. The balloon bursts, the trap door shuts, plummets back down to earth. They track it down with GPS. They bring it right into the clean room in the lab. They check it out and they're like, oh fuck, I've never seen anything that looks like this. Ergo, really? we've got an unidentified piece of life. And they have some Tom and Jerry shit right there. I'm not yeah, sure about that analogy. Weird. Just sending a, a, the balloon up with the box. Oh, of the, yeah, the that's some Wiley pops. Coyote shit. Yeah, yeah the, now the, I get the, it. The Acme fucking <laughs> yeah. alien yeah, like, catch kit. Fu- <laughs> <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> imagine <laughs> having to track that fucking thing down, <laughs> dude. Oh, my balloon God. Balloon box. Yeah, all right. Well, I mean, hey, I'd be interested to check that out and see what they actually found. That's kind of interesting. But okay, well, shit. Yeah, you know, I, I even as I wrote this, it didn't even occur to me until just now about that guy. Otherwise, I would have yeah. fucking yeah. included huh. him. All right, cool. It has also been suggested for those keeping score that star jelly and all of these other unidentifiable and often repugnant substances, substances, excuse me, are everything from slime mold or pond scum caught up in mini cyclones to industrial pollutants or even the detritus created by the U.S. government's top secret attempts to manipulate the weather. Looking at you, Harp. Oh, shit. That's right. Going to Harp. There has even been speculation that they are biological weapons launched against Earth by a technologically advanced alien species. That's a legit theory out there. Hmm. But whatever it is that seems to be lingering following strange celestial events, the question that haunts me is what was that pulsating purple glob that may or may not have been oozing its way up a telephone pole before it was busted by those Philadelphia cops back in September of 1950? While the temptation has always been, for me included, to lump it in with the star jelly phenomena, the fact remains that this relatively large, self-illuminated, quivering mass that might actually be, you know, self-motivated in locomotion, which would be fucking crazy, may actually represent a completely different type of potentially alien organism. But whatever the hell it was, there can be little doubt that the glittering iridescent violet mound that fell from the sky that long ago autumn eve may not only have managed to inspire one of the most beloved monsters in pop culture history, but to this day remains one of the greatest potentially biological mysteries of the 20th century. Maybe next time we'll get lucky and one of these motherfuckers will land on the lawn of the Smithsonian. It, right, ah, ah, and that's our star jelly slash purple oh, globs man. slash potential <clears throat> origin of the great fictional character of the blob. That is, yeah, Hollywood horrors, mysterious origins of, of the blob. A good, yeah, <laughs> sir. Yeah, man. there's there's a there's a lot here. There's a lot. Yeah. Um. All right. So as far as the uh, the Philadelphia one, if in fact that thing was climbing up a pole, uh, then, that changes everything. Well, that's then, a game changer. Yeah, that that makes me think that it clearly is. The thing I was thinking with that is like, let's say that that was some sort of whatever that fucking I don't know if it was puked or whatever. Sure. Uh, that's a lot to puke. It's a lot though. of puke. That's yeah. like like I think it a maybe, foot thick, four feet wide or right. something. Right. Like uh, like 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 when an animal dies and like, like quivers or whatever. Like it's like a. a, a like a weird reaction, like a nerve reaction, like we're just kind of like, uh, you know, doing so it. Think and then about, like going up. Well, I, I'm not know. trying to interrupt you, but let me. No, just, I think I talked myself out of that. Let, let me just say this: if, yeah, I really did. I, if this was no something sense. regurgitated, okay, then it means that it had to be something that could eat something that once it's chewed up, right, was that big? still remains a foot thick and four feet around. Yeah. Which yeah. means, are we going back to sky clam territory? Right, right. Blimp? Is it a fucking blimp? And going up the light pole makes me wonder, like, if it was in a blimp. <laughs> it's always a blimp. Maybe it was attracted to the light. That's why it was going up the pole. That's interesting. Yeah. I just thought of that myself. And here's the other thing. Oh, it was a pupa? It was, Maybe uh, it was just a bug. It looked it was like a blob. A, pupa. Oh. a big gigantic moth yeah. or a <gasps> pupa larvae. With the, the two little twins right? came out I mean, they're sink. kind of blobby. I mean, yeah, not not I'm, I'm, not sure. Sure. I'm, I'm marveling at the thought. Giant shit bug thing. Because it drifted <laughs> down. <A> moth <laughs> <sighs> Like, there's no meteor shower, right. so it's not necessarily following the star jelly pattern. It 
the, the, the only adjective that the officers use, or at least the reporter used that reported on it, was that it was drifting. So in my mind, I'm seeing this thing sail back and forth like yeah. a like oh, a piece of paper yeah, coming would, yeah, to earth. That, but really but I mean, fun. that might not have been at all. It might have been like a slow fall, but it was like because it's got such you know a big surface that maybe and it was pretty light it wasn't coming that fast uh-huh. or i mean if it was plummeting you'd think they would have said oh that thing fucking slammed Just down hit it, hard yeah. but this thing is coming down slower than something heavy ought to at least i'm gathering from that so i mean and and it's big so i mean you're right mm. i mean and obviously insects don't come that big anymore thankfully but but who the fuck knows yeah i mean could it be ectoplasm could a plane have hit a ghost <laughs> I mean, if it hit a Man. if it hit a sky amoeba, oh, if, if a plane smashed a sky amoeba, if the human dead fight the atmospheric beasts in a never ending war for dominion of Earth, that's your job when you die. Is that what Dominion whoa. Day really is about? Canada is whoa, that? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Damn, I don't sky want to wars of the sky dead? wars of the dead. Yes, oh, thank you. Okay, for putting words to my thoughts. I want to make that movie, but it's really expensive. Yeah, probably. dude, it's, we don't have that kind of budget because there's, there's going to be all sorts of categories of atmospheric right. monsters. Yeah, Crawfordsville Cyclops, the Super okay. Rods, the Sky Spitters, yeah. the Carnivorous Pink Shits. I mean, the sky rays, but then there's our ancestors, our family up there, tooth and nail, fighting for us, <laughs> fighting for America. Shouldn't have died, man. This sucks. <laughs> fighting for Earth. <laughs> Shouldn't have died. died. Sorry, Graham. She made it to World War to WW2, but guess what? And I got to go fight these Can sky I die bastards. again yeah, and go please. past this? I guess if it was a sky me, though, and it got hit by something and it crashed to Earth like that, maybe that would be that weird undulating that I was trying to get to earlier, where it's kind of like half fucking dead. You know, trying to like like a, like a deer dragging itself across the fucking road, trying to get itself back skyward to where its family is because it misses its children. You know, I love the idea of atmospheric I mean, creatures. Yeah. And obviously, I don't think planes can hit them willy nilly because otherwise it would be I fucking would carnage they everywhere would be all constantly. the time. Constantly. Like, it would how be are they like not? fucking metal albums everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you'd have, or, or they just are so diaphanous that they just, once you hit them with a propeller or like the nose cone or something, it's just like I think shreds into like nothing. a moth. Yeah. yeah the, we we talked dust. about this once before. Wow. Yeah. We're like, they're so fragile that like as soon as they get hit, they just disappear. Like, yeah. Like, like a tissue <laughs> in bath water. Well, if you're something that lives in the fucking air and you don't ever not be in the air, let's right. say you, like not space in, you know, gravity right. atmosphere. Yeah. 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 There, yeah. You cannot have the same you can't be dense no you're not going to be dense. right no you wouldn't and be. pressure would tear you apart it would make perfect oh, sense yeah just like i mean you have to be fucking <laughs> level tear us apart. if you had i mean sp- in space you you would probably be denser if you were like, oh space so. and now's and the meat. time to do it there are three thousand satellites around the earth yeah There's, really you think they pick, like, they pick one up now like, the fuck look what we found that's what grush we got you now's the time to move yeah, into the atmosphere yeah i mean i got also too though i guess considering if we're not talking, well, I guess this would be alien. If it is something on a meteor that crashes to Earth that through, you know, going through uh, a reentry, if it burns up or whatever, and this is kind of like, I mean, they don't really say it's, uh, it has to be a weird substance. You just, well, melt technically, right? Into like goo? I, it, I guess. I suppose. There's right? no evidence of burning at all, though. Yeah. So we have to address that. But just whatever, speaking strictly about the, the purple glob. But whatever Philly. it is, yeah. it fucking streaks in and it just melts. Right. Oh, what's a person? Oh, like an alien? No, it'd be shit. a chart. Like no, it could be like a person. Person. Oh man. Yeah, man. They just like Inside Out bear, dude. Think about it. Inside Out astronaut. I mean, it's some possible. poor Russian bastard up there. Like, fuck you, you're in to kick his ass off the the the, the shuttle, and then he just goes oh, into yeah, just cosmic goo. rays, cosmic him up like goo. an old Marvel comic character. Yeah, he just lands as a husk of shit, just all glo- gloopy and gloppy. Oof. Yeah, but it's that's a lot. But you think you'd find fragments of bone, you know, you'd maybe think. some traces of organ, oh, what uh, if human all? DNA, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, what yeah, if it all? Just, it's definitely like a quater mass experiment type thing, like one of those, like, uh, you know, the creeping unknown type things, like one of those great old British things yeah. where, like, all of those, like, there was a whole subgenre, you know, and now I'm getting back to the movie thing and I won't go too deep. Of right before human beings went into space, right before the, the you know, the, the Soviets broke that barrier where, like, oh, man needed to get up there. Man, 
regretted that decision immediately. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And like, yeah. there was like the first man into space is literally this guy is like, he's like a fucking s'mores gone wrong with one eye sticking out who needs to like drink blood to survive. The Incredible Melting Man was a 1970s version oh, yeah, of that yeah, same yeah, yeah, thing yeah, right. where he's gooping out everywhere. Rick Baker did the effects. There was a lot, the crawling, the crawling hand, I think it is, even though it's technically a crawling arm, the astronaut's arm is the only thing that survives and it goes around killing people. Yeah, so, revenge. The idea that, you know, People were truly, I mean, in the pop culture, terrified of like what human beings could experience in space. And while we know there's lots of dangerous uh, radiation up there and, and plenty of other, you know, perils to the life, um, maybe there's still some shady shit that gets kind of glossed over a little bit. You know, you got your yeah. thick, you know, your satellites, you got your environmental protection suit, but maybe if you get exposed to something, something can go awry. But I'm not inclined to think that this is something Earth sent up went wrong and came back. Okay. I'm more inclined to think it's something up there. Now, whether it's extraterrestrial and it was coming through the cosmos and mm. then hit here, or if it's something that just normally exists in the atmosphere, the reason I think I lean towards that, besides that I love the spectacular, you know, lost bestiary, not even lost, like never written bestiary of fucking atmospheric monsters is because um, it w- once this thing lands, it almost, you can't, if you touch it, it dissolves. Mm-hmm. If it's in front of air, it dissolves. If you play the Mountain Dew jingle backwards three times, it dissolves faster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, every, everything yeah, yeah. makes it go away. Oh, yeah. And I, so it's insubstantial. Yeah, because there's not yeah. really many samples of this. And there's no samples of this shit well, kicking around. Well, one in NASA. Allegedly. Allegedly. If you believe in NASA. Uh, sometimes. Nah, no, I mean, it's obviously a psyop. Well, clearly. Clearly. You know why? Why? The alleged moon. Son of a bitch. Yeah, gotcha. You did. Gotcha, boys. No, All right. a little burn. Well, little burn. I'm saying uh, I'm saying space cum. Space Chris? gum? Yeah, no. Space cum. Oh, Jesus Christ. Not space gum. God. Space cum. Space giants. Space giants. Gum. Space from, uh, cum from space, Christopher. Yeah, it's not that. It's not sky cum? No. Okay, cool. I know you want it to be. I was hoping you were just going to jump in Your fanfic is that it's fucking space gum, <laughs> but... <laughs> When you write your fanfic. Where do you guys stand on I'm, panspermia as a theory? I, I, I'm a fan. I, I'm Me a too. fan. I, yeah, I'm, I'm a all fan. about it. I mean, um, like, isn't it like octopus and shit, like mushrooms or something? They're like, these can't come from Earth. Well, they I don't know because I I've not like super researched it, Wait, but I've read the headlines and they octopus. were saying that the DNA of the octopus is so foreign to the things that have evolved here and everything else seems to have a lineage you can pretty much trace back right. now that we've like, you know, broken down genomes and whatnot. And it's like, oh no, that shit probably was seeded here. Not necessarily intentionally by right. an intelligent you know, thing, just, but panspermia, perhaps just riding on an yeah. asteroid dude, a meteor. Space no, I mean, octopi, it's, it's dude. All, it happens. What's it more happened. Lovecraftian or alien than an octopus too? Yeah, the well, t- most, tentacles. Most things in the ocean. And anything I, deep sea. But, yeah. but it makes sense. There was, it's mostly ocean. So if shit's going to hit, it's going to hit. Hit the ocean. Or at least oh, somewhere fucking near it. And fucking anglerfish and weird fucking, yeah, I know, gross shit. All teeth and lights. Or maybe this is some shit that normally goes into the ocean and just develops into some new unknown form of life. But instead, it just died on a yard in front of some fucking. Oh, so if it hits the water, yeah, dude. it becomes like a ninja or something. Yeah, like it, it can evolve to something. I mean, it would probably. It, I would be interested to see how it reacts with like with like water. Like if this thing is on a yard and you get a hose and you hose it off because that's my first. But what instinct. if it takes like saline? Like what if it takes salt water? Yeah, to or thrive? What, what if you just hit it with some water and it, it, it all of a sudden kind of like pulls a fucking thing on you? And the next thing you know, dude, it's all. I mean, it's right there. It's a story I mean, for you, a movie. Yeah, it could see. I mean, it makes more sense they would be water based and you got a one yeah, in seven totally. chance or a seven in one ch- i don't know i don't do odds but there's a lot more water than land as mark yeah. just said oh no, shit. yeah right oh, for sure so that for makes sure. makes perfect sense all right well i mean i think we nailed it honestly oh, oh well i mean yeah, it's solved i'm yeah. gonna say that uh that there's a lot of options so i'm gonna round it up with this obviously it's it's our ancestors fighting to save the day against the fucking hordes of space demons sky demons excuse me but that haven't been said. Um, keep your eyes peeled. Keep your mind open, and watch classic horror films. Now, I love my '80s shit. I love my I love my, my my Italian zombie films, and I love my mayhem. And there's all sorts of cool stuff. But every now and then, just go to your grandparents' movies because there's some really rollicking fun '50s monster movies, like Invasion of the Saucer Men. Yeah. The Blob. There you go. Thing from another world. The lists go on and on and on. And I would love to jabber jaw with almost anybody about it because it's like really one of my great joys. So uh, yeah. so I want to thank you guys and the listeners for indulging me this really sprawling odyssey that was only just, just had the loosest focus. 
But we did talk about Star Jelly finally. We did. Yeah, no, we, we did. really did. proud we of that. We fucking nailed Star Jelly, doll. So we fucking thank got you it. all for letting me go down the paths that I enjoy most. All right, well, Robert, thank you. Thank you so very much, everyone out there listening to the show. Robert, we got some shout outs, some thanks to give to the folks Hell who support yeah. us over there at patreon.com slash Podcast. Robert, let's do these shout outs. Good sir. Hoshia Kozilla. Oh, thank you, Hoshia. Nth Soccer. Hell yeah. Four two oh six. Oh, there finish. it is. Yeah. Daniel Young. Thank you, Daniel. Crystal Davies. Crystal. Dalton Thomas. Hell yeah, Dalton. Michael Kenninger. Yeah, what up? Dave from Northern Utah. <laughs> mm. Yo, what up, Dave from Northern Utah? Jason K. Thank you, Jason. David Mang. Thank you, Dave. Rounding it out. Dreamer. Oh, you're just a dreamer. Thank you so much for your continued support over there at patreon.com slash kryptonaut podcast. As mentioned at the top of the show, Friday, July 28th, 8.30 p.m. movie night with the boys, the Devil's Sword. If you're on the Discord, come uh, swing by and watch a movie with us. It's a super fun time. It's a super gnarly movie. I think y'all are going to enjoy it. And again, the Discord access is on the Patreon $1 and $5 tier. You will be able to connect yourself up there. Oh, uh, the social medias, boys. We're out there. We're doing it. The socials, the Instas, and the Twitters, and the Facebooks. Oh, and there's a new one. Thread. Mm. Yep. Oh. It's Instagram's version of Twitter. So I got us an account, because why the fuck not? We got to be there. We got to have a little bit of a thing happening. So yeah, we have a, a, a thread. So if you're on Instagram and you have thread, look for us. We're there. You know, hang out with us there. We'll be posting stuff on there. Kind of like cool we do beans. The, the normal socials. So check that out. I just checked all my shits today. I was very proud of me. Oh, you, yeah. All right. Yeah. You, went, you went to uh, Instagram, too? I went to my Instagram, and uh, I don't have a Twitter, and I checked my Facebook. All right. Well, good. And my email. Oh, it's shit. It's exciting. Really? Email. I mean, oh. not really. A little bit. Okay. M- mostly Instagram You're, I've and seen your Facebook. inbox. It's a, it's a panic attack. I just I just don't do things well. I mean, you do, do, delete messages, dude. Make sure life's so much easier. Yeah, but then sometimes I read something sweet from like 12 years ago. So create a folder. Call, call Rob, Rob's feelings. Put it in the folder. There you go. You can create folders? You sure can. Well, email. I'll be dipped. That's entirely how I... It's a whole new world. That's how I organize everything with this podcast is folders. Well, I'll... Yeah, Windows, dude. I'll be. It's all folders. <laughs> It's all folders, dog. It's all folders, yeah. dude. It's all directories, Life is dude. literally all folders. <laughs> mm, that's fair. I mean, uh, I usually uh, use Manila because I'm old, but yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, computer folders, buddy. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. All right. But you know what? We're going to make it happen. We're going to get you there. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, there's all that. Heatherspace.com. Get some clothes. Cryptonautmerch.com. Get some more exclusive clothes. It's the oh. summer. It's hot. Do some shit. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Merch. Yeah, there's merch. <clears throat> My voice cracked. There's a bunch of merch shells happening all the time, but be sure to do that. Uh if you are on T Public, uh they will text message you every time there is a sale. That's dope. Yeah, it's kind of cool, actually, because every time a sale happens, I'm like, what is T Public getting a hold of me for? I'm like, oh, there's a sale. Oh, Fucking we're gonna cool. we're gonna have to decide no, I know. when the time comes for the revelations of the Dark Heineck. Is it gonna be a crowd mate or a T Public? Oh, should we make them fight? Let's make them fight. You tell them, oh like, listen God. here, listen here, assholes, get in the ring and fight for our love. Yes. Which one? Which one of you guys get down? <laughs> Which one of you guys get? We're just going to get a hold of our raps, be like, all right, listen, you're going to fight to see who gets it. Okay. Settle <laughs> <And answer>. down. <laughs> oh, shit. There you have it. Thank you all so very much. Oh, you know what? Before we leave, huge thank you. To our girl Dana Bruce. Oh, hell what yeah. Up, Dana? Oh, you brought man. it up earlier. Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah. she sent us this dope Monsters. package. Monsters. She got us some sweet Ultraman kaiju from Japan. I'm holding mine right now. Chris is holding his. Yeah. Yeah, Here's I, his home. I got mine at home on my shelf from my other kaiju. Oh, I got my Dark King. I and love it. What's super Black King? Black King, my and bad. What's also super cool um, is when she was there, she had, she had posted up pictures on her Instagram. And dude, she oh, was. Oh, did in, you see it? Are you talking about the T-shirt? No, no, no. Uh, the she was in like a kaiju themed, like an Ultraman kaiju themed bar. What? Yeah, I'm like, dude, I would love the to get hammered fuck? there. I know. Of course, I would just would. talk to Ultraman all night and just be like, "You get me? You're 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 a man of life." But Nebula M, you fucking understand me, dude. I love Ultra Seven. <laughs> you want you to stab me? <laughs> yeah. oh, first off, yes, dream come true, fucking total bucket list. Oh, it's awesome. Get wasted at oh, the I fucking know. Ultraman bar. Secondly, I think she mentioned in one of her posts that in Argentina she found uh, a Sam the Sandown clown um, T-shirt. Oh shit, she did. That's right. Yeah, that, she I think had like the original Bufora like yes, illustration yes, on yes, it. Yes. It was so cool. Dang. Dude. 
Check her out. Uh, just go on Instagram and look up Dana Bruce. You're uh, awesome. She Dana. has a whole like travel thing that she does too, which is super cool. Like just all the different traveling that she goes what to. She gets cool pictures. It's awesome, dude. It's so cool. So. We still have the pyramid, the the good luck pyramid oh, on yeah, the on the no, table. For sure, for sure. Start chilling. So Dana, thank you so very much. We it's so awesome. We appreciate it so much. It's so cool. Totally. And uh, yeah, so there you have it. Thank you all so very much, and we'll be talking to you soon. Goodbye. Later. Mm. Yes. What's the next movie going to be when we finally do this again, boys? It's Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> I'm trying to think. <laughs> Actually, that would be a cool one to do. Creature from the Black Lagoon would be fucking dope. Because that's so many cool cryptids. But this isn't a multi-parter. Okay. That'll be a volume thing. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Some yeah, point, yeah. Okay, uh, some point in the yeah, future. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not going to be every week uh, Uncle Bobby picks a brand new old okay, favorite cool. movie and then wraps yeah. war yeah. around well, it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Shit. All right, cool. Thank no, you. That, that's how I go crazy in my mind palace. <laughs> yeah, that's no, not that's how happen. we. That's how we lose Uncle Bob. Bye.